Hi, this is Paul. Uh, Jordan Peterson did another conversation, end of year conversation with the Dutch blog. It's kind of a shock blog. I talked with Roland about it back almost a year ago when he had the previous conversation with this particular Dutch blog. They had their conversation right after the Kathy Newman interview. Now, the whole video is is one of the most worthwhile videos that Peterson has, well, he's posted some good ones with Roger Scruton, was an excellent video, the conversation with the, on the Rubin Report with, with Dave Dave Rubin and Ben Shapiro was an excellent one. But I thought this this video was outstanding. And after listening to it a couple times, I, I, I really think that Jordan Peterson is building the most potent natural theology of this generation. Well, what do I mean by that? That natural theology is the project of trying to find and explain God from the ground up. And as I listened to Peterson, as I was thinking about the fact earlier in the video, he talks about two and a half sales of two and a half million books, this book tour all around the world, 115, 115 events, book events in one year, 365 days, 115 events. That's a staggering schedule and the amount of travel, and he's still doing it. And... In this, listening to this video, I he, continue to hear him develop and nuance, and he, I think, is getting more, a better and better understanding in his own way of Christianity and how it works, and he's contributing more and more in terms of figuring this stuff out in ways that people connect with, and that's why I think this is, this is, he's building the most potent natural theology of this generation. That's, so let's, I'm going to start the video at minute 36. I don't know if I'm going to have time right now to go through the rest of the video. The whole video is worth watching. The first part of the video, he talks about the book tour, and then he talks about uh, freedom of speech stuff and some of those kinds of things. Don't, those don't generally, those aren't generally the focus of my channel, so you can watch them on your own. I'm sure Adam Friended will pick them up and do some things with them, but for minute 36, we really start to get into the natural theology. And when I heard him say, well, we're going to talk about the movie Gladiator, I thought, well, that's kind of funny. The movie's been out a long time. and But actually, it really, really worked well for this video. And it really opened up the conversation. And I think this is one of the best videos I've heard from Peterson in a while. So let's. I'm just going to play it. And I'm going to do my commentary and throw in a few things as we go along. And... I've got an appointment at noon, so this will be about an hour and a half. I'm sure I won't get through the whole thing. Um, so, Gladiator. I think this movie is ingrained in the psyche of my generation more so than any other, like, epic epic movie of its of its sort. So there and, and that surprised me. I... I enjoyed the movie. I saw the movie a long time ago. I hadn't... I've seen it now and then over the years. I hadn't seen the movie since I've been listening to Jordan Peterson and or done any of this thinking, but this individual says it's the biggest movie of his generation, I assume, in the Netherlands, and I thought, wow, I didn't know it was that impactful. So go ahead, tell us why. There's other characters. There's, there's Aragorn from Lord of the Rings. There's Hector from Troy. There's William Wallace from Braveheart. There's Spartacus. There's Leonidas from 300. All these characters are the same archetypal figures. But somehow only Maximus Decimus Meridius really sticks, really sticks through the years, and I have uh, I've I've put some thought into this, and I have some ideas about why particularly this character and this movie uh, sticks. I want to present to you three points that culminate in what I think is the implicit central thesis that runs throughout the movie. So I'm going to list now the three points and then the central thesis. Point number one is that Maximus is by far the best modern portrayal of the male archetype. Um, so he's highly capable, but very gentle, and he's modest in word and body language, and he's admired and loved solely for his character and skill. So that's the, that's the portrayal of the archetype. Point two is that the movie also contains the very best modern portrayal of the embittered villain, whose character and skill are simply insufficient, and he makes up for it through deceit and cruelness while still knowing every step of the way that eventually he'll lose. There's nothing he can do about it. And three, 
the characters themselves are, are exquisite in their own right. But in this movie, they're juxtapositioned within a hostile brother framework, which makes it, which is a deeply archetypal framework, which might be the reason that it, it sticks so much more than all the other archetypal figures. And this brings me to the central thesis. And I'm, I only figured this out two days ago, and I'm very excited to get to share this with you. I think the central implicit thesis throughout the whole movie is as follows, that no matter how powerful someone is, the pain of a man whose soul has been irreversibly corrupted far exceeds the pain of a righteous man whose wife and son have been murdered and who's been reduced to abject slavery. Which is really something to, to think about. Yeah, right. <laughs> this, this part is so funny because Peterson kind of puts on his college professor hat and here, here, here the young man has turned in his term paper and he's so excited about his thesis and Peterson's about to, eh, don't want to discourage you, but basically accepts it because he's basically right, but I love where Peterson goes now. Yeah, well, they, okay, so the themes that you've been developing there. Well, okay, so the first thing we might also note, though, that, that you um, lost over, maybe that's the right way of thinking about it. <laughs> Mr. College Professor, he's, well, let's, uh, we get a B plus here. Well, let's, let's see if we can get it up into A category. Is that Maximus is a paragon of soldierly virtue, right? He's a now, bear in mind, Peterson never saw this movie back in 2000 or so when it was out. And so he just watched it the night before in anticipation of this conversation. So it's fresh in his mind. And and I'm really impressed. It, I'm really impressed at what Peterson and this this young man are going to do with this conversation. It's really good. A physical combatant, a warrior. Yeah. He's dutiful. Uh, he serves his commander, but also serves the principles more importantly, yeah. serves the principles that govern his commander. And he yeah. serves the principles more than the commander himself. And, and this goes back to Peterson's biblical series, where Peterson always notes that the you, you, serve, you serve what is above the king. There is always something above the king. And, and Peterson articulates that well here. And you can tell that because he chooses not to serve the new emperor, Commodus. Yeah. Because he doesn't believe that he abides by the proper principles. And Commodus, of course, also killed his, his own father, which yeah. means that he killed the principles by which the state... Um, he's, like, he's like the elder gods in the Mesopotamian creation myth who kill Apsu, who's their father, and then try to live on his corpse. But it doesn't work out well for them. All that does is breed chaos, and that's exactly what happens in, in, in the movie Gladiator as well. Yeah. Um, and that Maximus as son is an interesting, S-O-N, is also an interesting character because he becomes son as a consequence of his virtue rather than as a consequence yeah. of his birth, right? Commodus exactly. has, the, has the advantage of birth, but Maximus has the advantage of virtue. But it's, it's virtue, it's a virtue of strength. And, um, you know, that makes the movie, in some sense, also extremely barbaric. There's just endless death and killing, which is a very strange thing when you're talking about someone who's operating within a fundamentally moral framework. And I guess part of the moral of the story is that it's better to be a soldier than a coward. And that's a, you know, that's, it's not, I would say that on the one hand that's self-evident and on the other hand that's a mystery because the coward might be able to avoid the mayhem and killing that characterizes the life of the soldier. Anyways, Maximus does organize himself under the virtues of courage and, and forbearance and strength. Yeah, so, so my observation is actually, of course, he's, he's a very powerful soldier, but my observation is that that is not the reason, not so much the reason this archetype sticks. How I read this character, that he is the, the absolute embodiment of the characteristics that allow you to contend with tragedy and malevolence in an optimal way. Not just on the battlefield. It's not really about the battlefield. Right. Well, you see, you see his soldierly um, capability as a representation of competence itself. Yeah. Competence gu guided by principle. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. And I also think that that's probably how the conduct of a soldier should be judged, right? 
Yeah. And it appears that soldiers are necessary despite the mayhem that warfare produces. Yeah. We haven't figured out how to dispense with that necessity. Yes. So do you think, oh, sorry, do you think the Canaan, the, do you think that the Canaan Able framework in which it is implicitly uh, structured, do you think that adds to, to how much a story sticks? Yes, definitely. Like the, why, why is that? Well, because the, the story of Cain and Abel does lay out very, very elegantly and, and with incredible compression two fundamentally opposed modes of being. The mode of being that characterizes Abel, the favorite son, and the mode of being that characterizes Cain. And Abel is competent and virtuous and God-fearing, let's say, but more practically, which, which means he's allied with the highest of principles. That, that's the right way to think about it psychologically. Whatever the, that high, the highest of principles might be, there's an attempt. One of the things that you might consider psychologically is that the movement from polytheism to monotheism parallels, parallels the integration of the individual psyche and the development of larger and larger scale social organizations. All those things. Now, now the first piece, the development of the individual psyche is a point that he made in the biblical lectures. The second point, I don't recall that he made it in the biblical lectures. And so this is a, this is an interesting point because what he's essentially saying is that there's something essential to there's something correlative between monotheism and larger, more stable forms of government, which is which is really fascinating given the history, let's say, of colonialism in the West. When the British arrived in what today we call India, it was a patchwork of kingdoms, polytheistic kingdoms. The British come with their monotheism and they basically organize the country into, into one into one country um, so it, it's, it's a very interesting observation and I'm, I'm not sure that I had heard him make it before I'll back up so we can hear it again and again I know some of you complain that well I'm, I'm, I'm pausing it well that's kind of the purpose of what I do with these visits these videos go go to his channel you can listen to the whole thing all the way through I promise I won't interrupt a single time but uh, that's what that's what I do here it's happened it develops the integration of the individual psyche and the development of larger and larger scale social organizations. All those things happen at the same time. So you imagine that the larger scale the organization, the human organization, so the more people included under the umbrella of the same state, the more organized and orderly the principles by which that state have to function must be because mm -hmm. of the increasing complexity and also the, the, the problem of having to determine how the state can remain intact over a long period of time without fragmenting. And, and that's so interesting in terms of this association with polytheism versus monotheism. I, this is a completely new thought for me. So the state has to organize itself so that the needs and wants of the bulk of the population are met with sufficient regularity so that the state itself doesn't fragment. And that means that the state has to organize itself in what you might regard as an, a virtuous manner that can be iterated. And at the same time, the people who compose the state in its increasing complexity have to ally themselves with that long-term state goal. So it's a, it's, a, it's a coalition between psychological integration and sociological complexity. And, and that's, that is foreshadowed, we might say, or accompanied by the movement from polytheism, which is the pulling of people in all directions by fundamental motivational and natural forces, into monotheism, which is the direction of the individual uh, under the rubric of a single set of principles, a single superordinate set of principles. And now that's, again, that's, that's such an interesting idea in terms of how this is mirroring. So the, and, and this is, this makes perfect sense if you listen to Peterson back at the, 
I think it was Lafayette College, that conversation where he, where he talks about what religion is. And so polytheism has multiple, basically multiple competing top value virtues within hierarchies, whereas with monotheism, they there's the pressure to get them integrated so you can have one coherent system. It, it's just very interesting the way he puts it together. Again, it was completely new thought for me. Never thought of it. Fascinating. Now, what those principles are is not obvious, which is partly why we're having the discussion of gladiator. So I, I can give you an example of this. So, for example, um, in the Old Testament, you see the articulation of the guiding principles emerge in its most fully formed manner with the commandments of Moses. Uh, you have to ask a question, well, what is the Old Testament? It's the law and the prophets and the writings. It's those three sections. And the law is the first five books. Now, now, obviously, in the Decalogue, which is the Ten Commandments, and then in the 613 laws that comprise these laws in Exodus and Deuteronomy, that is, in some senses, the law, but, but also Genesis is the law. And, and they're in different forms of law. Now, he's going to go on to make the, the point that he made in the biblical lectures with respect to his... Let's call it an etiology, a an origin story of how the law emerges, which is a very interesting thing to think about and and something worth talking about. But it's the you have the covenant and and the covenant works in conjunction with the narratives. Okay? And and so when you ask what the law is, well it's really the first five books. Well, the first five books have lots of things besides laws. And and so laws play a very big role, obviously, the, the mosaic the mosaic law. But what one of the things that Peterson hasn't yet really integrated is the covenantal aspect to these laws, which is which so so in other words, he's still working through this. I mean, obviously he hasn't gotten to Deuteronomy yet, but so, so that's a that's a that's a little hemming and hawing that I'm doing here, a little yeah, budding. So you might say, all of the diverse forces that might pe pull people hither and yon have been aggregated into a list of thou shalt nots. Here's how to regulate yourself. Here's how to mm -hmm. inhibit yourself across time, so that you can have it. And and that's really good. Here's how to inhibit yourself across time. And and it was interesting when he talked to Ian McGilchrist talking about something with the fact that like 40 percent of our neurons are inhibitors and and one of the big differences we have between let's say the chimpanzees chimpanzees are very they, they have no inhibition we have quite a bit of inhibition and and so the law acts as even more inhibitors you shall not kill you shall not commit adultery now that's the second table of the law the first table of the law, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make. So there, there's some negatives there. You shall honor your father and mother. So a stable, long-term, large-scale society. But then there's a mystery that emerges in the New Testament, which is it emerges, for example, when Christ is asked by the scribes and Pharisees, which is the greatest of the commandments? Now, it's important to know Christ has asked that, but that was a standard question, and the answer that Jesus gives is the standard answer. So not everything that we have from Jesus is original to Jesus. We know this because we know it because we have teachings from that period and because a lot of what Jesus actually teaches is from the Old Testament. But this, but I, again, I really like what Peterson is doing. So you take all of these laws and say, well, what is the law? Well, the law is embodied. Now, it's very interesting what Peterson does and doesn't say with it here. And Christ actually performs a very intelligent sleight of hand, and he says, well... See, and again, this, this is a standard answer that Jesus gives. This isn't, this isn't new to Jesus, but it, it was the standard answer that was given. It's, in a sense, a catechism question. 
you have to love God with all your heart and all your soul, and you have to love your brother as if he's yourself, love your neighbor as if he's yourself. On, on those two propositions rest all the commandments and the law. There's an attempt to integrate even the commandments into something that's a higher order principle, and that higher order principle actually manifests itself in, in Judeo-Christian society as the logos. When it manifests itself as the logos, yes. There's a few jumps in between there because love is the command, and and this I, I've talked talked a little bit about it in my Sunday school class this past Sunday. I haven't posted it yet. And and it's interesting how Peterson seldom talks about love in these contexts, and and part of that is that I think that love is complicated. Love is huge. Love is, in our culture and in our language, something that we connect with an emotional response or an emotional experience, whereas in the ancient world, love is what the inferior owes the superior. And so there very much is obligation in that command to love, but it's 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 very broad, but, but it's interesting how Peterson doesn't doesn't stop here on love and and that's others have pointed this out in terms of his treatment that he, he doesn't really go into love even though it's obviously all of the commands get then basically said love and augustine picks this love picks this up love and you fulfill the law whatever that is and it's something like truthful communication devoted towards the highest good See, and, and so he, he jumped to Logos. Now, of course, God is love, uh, first epistle of John. Jesus is love. But then he jumps to truthful communication as Logos, which truth is in there. But if you're watching my Sunday school class on the first epistle of John, the first epistle of John, which is probably a commentary on the gospel of John, works very hard to integrate truth, love, remaining. I just did this in last week, so I guess I'll have to upload it. But So there's more work that needs to be done there. But it, it's interesting, again, how Peterson doesn't dwell on love and he immediately jumps to truthful communication via the Logos. Now, again, the Logos isn't misplaced there, but I, I'm not sure that all connects. And, and the embodiment of that becomes the fundamental principle. And, and in Gladiator, you see movement towards that embodiment, right? Because Maximus is an organized and disciplined person who's governed by principle. The question is, and the question is posed throughout the movie, well, what is Rome, right? That, that's asked for, five yeah. times. it's asked by Marcus Aurelius because he feels that a lot of what he's done is a failure. It's asked by Commodus and it's asked by the, the sister uh, whose, whose name escapes me at the moment. Lucilla. What is Rome? It's what? I think it's Lucilla. Okay, okay, okay. Um, and they all ask, well, what is Rome? And she comes the closest. She says it's a great idea. But it, it's not. It's an animating principle. And the question is... Now, I love that, too. What is Rome? Rome is an animating principle. If you go back to Jonathan Peugeot and I, my conversation with Jonathan Peugeot about principalities and powers, Rome is... Rome is an animating principle. Is There's a principality and power. Now, you get to, let's say, Augustine's City of God. I should, I should pull up that, that audio book. This is, this is one of my... I know I, I talk a lot about philosophy and religion in the West by Philip, uh, Philip Carey, which is a, a, one of the great courses that I really enjoy. I've listened to it a couple of times. This one is my favorite. Uh, books That Matter, The City of God by Charles Matthews. And because he goes into Augustine and the libido dominandi and, and what the Roman Empire is. And one of, one of the things that struck me about Gladiator is Gladiator is a post-Christian representation of what the Roman Empire is. And, and that comes through very clearly with uh, Tom Holland's conversation with N.T. Wright on Unbelievable. That was that was last year because Tom Holland set some of these things out. Cicero's great content. And so and so what we see from Maximus is is very is really very much the 
the principle, the the principality, the the governing principle that is being expressed by Maximus is is really a someone who has now been shaped by Christianity, not necessarily Rome, as 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 Tom Holland will note here. Temporary Caesar is by some accounts, slaughtering a million Gauls and enslaving another million in the cause of, of boosting his political career. And far from feeling in any way embarrassed about this, he's kind of promoting it. And yeah. so when he holds his triumph, people are going through the streets of Rome carrying billboards, boasting about how many people he's killed. And this is, this is a really terrifyingly alien world. And the more you look at it, the more you realize that it is built on systematic exploitation. Mm -hmm. um, so the entire economy is founded on slave labor right the the sexual economy is founded on the absolute right of free roman males to have sex with anyone that they want any way that they like mm. and in almost every way this is a world that is unspeakably cruel to our way of thinking mm. and so this worried me more and more <laughs> and it was kind of like i was thinking well you know, I'm clearly not, as I'd vaguely imagined, the heir of the Greeks and the Romans in any way, really. And and so where am I coming from? And it was like a kind of itch, you know, you get right. on your back and you, yeah, yeah. you can't find it. <laughs> and this was then enhanced for me by then writing a book about the about late antiquity and the emergence of Islam from... The, the, the late religious, mm. con the, the, co the religious and imperial context mm. of late antiquity. And again, finding in Islam a, a, a profound quality of the alien that, you know, there were aspects of Islam that were very familiar, but there were many aspects of it that again, seemed deeply, deeply alien. And I began to realize that actually, in, in, in almost every way, I am Christian. Mm. And I began to realize that actually, Paul, although in, in, in many ways, he seems a much less familiar figure than Cicero, mm. the kind of, you know, urbane man with his property problems. <laughs> uh, you know, Paul never had any property, he just made, made tents. Yes. Um, <laughs> that, 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 that in almost every, the, you know, the, uh, what is it, se seven that is, the seven letters that are people conventionally, yeah, uh, people absolutely yeah. accept, yeah. That, you know, and, and as, as Tom Wright was saying, you know, this is not <laughs> a very lengthy <laughs> amount of writing, but compacted into this very, very small amount of writing, was almost everything that explains the modern world. Well, the and, Western and, and world, as we take for granted. The, the, yeah. Yes, yeah. but also the way that the West has then moved on to shape, you know, concepts like international law, for instance. So the the the, 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 the fact the you know concepts of human rights, all these kind of things. Ultimately, they don't go back to Greek philosophers. They don't go back to Roman imperialism. They. Re they go back to Paul. Some and of Paul, the humanists really and atheists. Is, you know, I, his letters, his yeah. letters, I think, are, along with the, 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 the four Gospels, the most influential, the most impactful, the most revolutionary writings that have emerged from you, you, the ancient and, and world. When, when you penned that, that, that article, I think it was for the uh, New Statesman, New Statesman what where you said, said what I got wrong, yeah. and, and you, you sort of came out, as it were, and said... Uh, as far as my values and you know background are concerned, I am a Christian. Yeah. Um, it was interesting to see the response to that because I saw lots of atheists and humanists saying, "Oh, hang on, you know, we democracy that goes back to the Greeks. You know, yeah. that's, don't pretend that Christianity gave us everything we're grateful for." But you honestly think that actually people simply haven't appreciated just how much we owe to well, to I, I, I think I think um, I mean, if we're talking of Paul, I think of him as a kind of depth charge. <laughs> deep beneath the foundations of the classical world and you know it's it's not anything that you particularly notice if you're you know in Corinth or Alexandria and then you start feeling this kind of rippling outwards and you know by the time you get to the 11th century in 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 Latin Christendom everything has changed and you have this gr I, 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 I think essentially what's Paul's significance is, is that he sets up ripple effects of revolution throughout Western history. Mm. So the 11th century, where with the papal revolution, essentially it establishes um, this idea that society has to be reborn, reconfigured, mm. that vested interests have to be torn down. And then the Reformation, what we call the Reformation, is a further ripple effect of that, and the Enlightenment is a further ripple effect of that. And That's very Mm. You, you know, it, yeah. it, it spilled out so much that now in the 21st century, we don't even realize where these ripple effects are coming from. We just take them for granted. So 
unbelievable. Watch it. It's a great show. Justin Brierley does does absolutely terrific work. Back to Peterson. That that what what Maximus has here is he embodies the the Roman principality. What is Rome? And Maximus is basically like, Maximus is Rome, and and he embodies it and he acts it out. And but now of course, in the year two thousand, the Rome we look back on is the Rome and and the Rome that we value in Maximus. We don't we don't find Maximus, um, you know, raping his slaves because that would not be that would not fit an American vision of what a hero should do a a high status roman in that time period like as tom holland would say basically the the sexual ethic was if you're high status and you're a male just take what you want that obviously isn't in the movie the movie is geared to our context and the movie expresses our context but peterson is dead on right within the frame of the film maximus is expressing the archetype of of what it means to be a the true Roman, what it means to be Rome, the principality in power. One story, and then we aggregate a hundred stories of undesirable life, and then we have. Now let's back up a little bit. Look like when someone, when a, a particular person lives an undesirable life, we tell the story of something. We've had to gather as a collective. We've had to gather information about well, what is it? What does it look like when someone, when a, a particular person lives an undesirable life? We tell the story of someone who lives an undesirable life. Or maybe... And and I just did that. Let's say Nero, you know, Nero would Nero was known to, you know, he'd find a political enemy and he would, you know, basically rape the man right there on the streets of Rome. This is what a Roman emperor could do. Now, if Donald Trump tried to tried to rape Chuck Schumer on the Senate floor, uh, I, I think I think he could be convicted of that. Donald Trump isn't going to do it. That that is that is gone. And but even telling the story here, this is how you know we have this big conversation about okay, where does Brett Weinstein get his morality that he imagines we can transcend our programming? Where where is this implicit morality that we're all walking around with and we feel it in our bones? This morality, where does it come from? Well, it comes from this process of stories, and it comes from the movies we watch, and it comes from the stories we tell in family, and it comes from we're we're constantly having these moral conversations. I just caught a little bit of. Jonathan Haidt on Joe Rogan this morning, and and Jonathan Haidt rightly said we're we're amazingly tuned to status, and we're once we have our basic needs met, then we we just continue to play status games. And morality is one of the key elements of these status games. Well, how does how do we construct our morality? We do it through all these stories, as Peterson is saying. Maybe he tells his own story, and then we aggregate a hundred stories of undesirable life, and then we abstract out from those stories what constitutes undesirable. And so that's like a picture of Cain, right? It's a portrait of Cain. Mm-hmm. And we do the same thing on the other side. We, we listen to people who, who've lived triumphantly and we aggregate their stories and we synthesize them. We say, well, then we, we, we extract from that a portrait of Abel. And that's a precursor. Like the successful and the unsuccessful are precursors to Abel and Cain. And Abel and Cain are precursors to the divine figures, the quasi-divine figures, or the divine figures of Christ and Satan, right? It's it's an abstract process of continual abstraction. And that- now, the demonic is interesting because Christ and Satan, and and so actually yesterday I had a conversation with, I don't know if he hasn't told me yet whether or not he wants me to post it, but I had a conversation about the demonic with, with someone. And what's interesting about the demonic and this, this individual raised the character of the Joker in the Christopher Nolan, the second of the Christopher Nolan trilogy of of Batman, and well, what what is evil? Well, I think as Alfred says in that movie, some people just like to watch the world burn, and and evil isn't just well, I'm going to take this from you because it's mine. There's a logic to that, and and truly, demonic evil doesn't even have that logic. It's just bent on destruction. And, and derives its joy from destruction. 
and and again we we know this at a deep level and then as we talked about the film he said well a lot of people really identify with the street with the joker and and really applaud it and i said you know that doesn't mean that they're evil it it means that they've they're looking at the excellence in storytelling and the excellence in filmmaking and and so when when you watch the joker in in what is it dark knight rising i don't remember what the second one was called but i do remember the second one with heath ledger playing the joker the the, the acting the storytelling it's just well well done and so people are attracted to it not because they're attracted to evil but because they're attracted to the excellence of the storytelling that's all done through at least to begin with through ritual and narrative and art it, it's so yeah. complicated it can't be done any other way so first it's acted out then it enters the domain of ritual uh, art and and narratives Yes. Then it's uh, then it becomes operational, like an operational. Right. And, and then those. And and this is what Peterson reiterates. It's in Twelve Rules for Life. It's in his biblical series. This is kind of the process that that Peterson says. This is how we as human beings come to these things. Things loop, right? Because once you they get loop. the image, sure. Well, once you get the image and the ritual and the drama, then those modes of communication start to alter behavior. Yeah. You know, so it's like, well, that's why we're having this discussion. We're talking about Gladiator. We're talking about a movie that's an artistic representation. Yeah. And we're discussing it to articulate principles. And we're also articulating those principles so that in principle, our behavior can be altered. Yeah, that's exactly. Ah, I never thought about the loop. Oh, yes. You have to think about the loop. These things, these things feed back. And Peterson is exactly right. That's why... That's why we see Gladiator. That's why we keep making movies. That's why we keep trying our hands at these representations. That's why other stories come into play. That's why we keep doing this because we, we, we're, we, we're keeping, we, again, now this is natural theology. We are working our way towards the city of God, as Jordan Peterson will end this by, by talking about. Right, so the be, it's, it's the collective behavior. It's that negotiation at the collective, level that fractious centuries long millennia long negotiation that yeah. produces something like a synthesis yeah and that, that synthesis is represented in in drama and mythology and ritual and art yeah. and then that's articulated but those loop and so the whole process starts to spiral upward yeah maybe a spiral upward at an increasingly rapid rate yeah. So what I what what I what I was always wondering is that if these archetypal patterns that lead to the most favorable life are already known for such a long time, why does any every generation seem to have to invent them anew? Well, there's there's known and known. Like one of the things yeah. that, that played. I, I I often use the I often use the Spanish. The Spanish says conocer and saber, and and conocer is to know. Adam knew Eve. Um, now I know. Saber is more a fact, and and so it's. And I think Ian Ian McGilchrist talks about this. It's on Vimeo. This this lecture to an educational group, but he talks about what it means to understand, and and what it means is is that remember how I talked about how language is in it's the association language language really isn't contained by words. Language is contained in the relationship between words. And, and so this knowing, we know full well, you can watch someone ride a bike. If you've never ridden a bike, you don't really know how to ride a bike, even if you can sit there and describe how all the movements that the bike rider is using in order to propel the bike. To actually ride the bike is a different level of knowing. This is the colonization. This is the, this is the embodiment. You know, the Socrates insisted on was that all learning was remembering okay so let's say that when you're born you you have a proclivity to manifest a number of patterns and, and you certainly do you can manifest the patterns of rage and and fear and hunger and thirst and like but but then also imagine okay so it, it's something like this as this looping process has occurred the people who are more likely to manifest the pattern that is being pointed to are more practically likely to live and to successfully 
propagate. That's natural law. You just you just put it right there, okay? And and so now natural law is going to become natural theology as he continues to move it. Now again, I am saying he is the most potent. I'm not saying he gets everything right. He's building the most potent natural theology that I see anywhere right now. And this is where he's doing it. So so here's the natural law. This gets this is built into us. He covered that with Sam Harris in terms of the the a priori structures. It gets it gets into it gets into mate selection and and then we it's it's the game that we all we are all playing but we're not necessarily conscious of it's it's far deeper than that so there's an evolutionary element yeah. that kicks in right yeah. so if the society values something and the degree to and and this is where the principalities and powers come in because not all societies value the same thing again if you go to the the Jonathan hate conversation with joe rogan jonathan hate talks about how this Filipino society valued, they gained status by headhunting other tribes. And he talks about how right now call-out culture gains value at the expense of people outside their group. So, so each society has a principality and power. And in each society, therefore, has a hierarchy, and they embody it. My book of Ecclesiastes I preached on a couple of weeks ago, Ecclesiastes is about an alpha male. And, and so... You look at Ecclesiastes, you look at the New Testament. What, what you see is this this continual this continual working on what ought we to embody. You look at Job. You look at Abraham. You look at David. You look at Elijah. Now, now David is embodying the kingly archetype. Elijah is embodying the prophetic role. Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. Jesus is the integration of them. He's the he's the sum of the hierarchies, but. But there are principalities and powers connected with these hierarchies and these embodiments. To which you manifest that value is proportionate to your success. Yeah. And your success is proportionate to your reproductive fitness. Then, as, then over time, the proclivity for that sort of ethical behavior will become coded in some sense in your genetic yeah. structure. <clears throat> selected for for that yeah and so then you might say well that exists this is this is what the archetype is in some sense it, it exists as the possibility of being gripped by a particular kind of vision now there might be enough diversity in the ideal so that you can't emerge from the womb let's say fully christian <laughs> if you, if you, <laughs> it's amazing you know, you know what i mean <laughs> ideal and, and again, you, that's why I included Tom Tom Holland's comments here because, and this is why Jordan Peterson says to Sam Harris and Matt Dillahunty, "Well, you're way more Christian." He doesn't say it this way. You're way more Christian than you care to admit. You just are, and because it's been built into who you are for generation after generation since Christianity, and you don't know it. That's that's the most powerful aspects or the things that we 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 just assume, but but there it is. So that you can't emerge from the womb, let's say fully Christian. If you you know you know what I mean. Put it that way. Yeah, um, yeah, I understand. But but that doesn't mean that there won't be something that beckons to you as a consequence of observing the manifestation of a kind of ideal. And yeah. that it does back into you because otherwise you wouldn't be gripped by the damn stories. Now, earlier in the video, before the part that I played, he talked about basically competition between stories, and that's exactly right. The best story wins. But but how do we know the best story wins when we have these competing principalities and powers, when we have these these competing hierarchies? Well, natural law, natural theology says, well, the God of redemption is the God of creation. This is built into us. Well, well, how are we supposed to find it? Well, actually, we're always working on it. Yeah. But, but, but here's the rub, too. It can't be hard-coded exactly. So, look, here's, here's something interesting about Christianity. 
It was actually posed as an interesting question in, in the musical Jesus Christ Superstar near the end. Um, the, 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 the actor who played Judas asks Christ after he's dead. There, there's sort of a, there's a scene where everyone's singing and dancing. It's a strange sort of quasi-disco scene. And Judas asks why Christ had to come to earth at such a strange time and in such an isolated place. Because he appears as a carpenter in a backwoods region, you know, 2,000 years ago. Why then? Why there? And the answer is, the, the divine principle has to manifest itself constantly within the confines of an individual life, with all of the peculiarities and idiosyncrasies and limitations of that individual life. And so part of the reason that the ideal beckons is because you can't just be born as Christ, because what Christ represents, let's say this overarching ideal, is actually the union of the divine with the particulars of your time and place. And so because you're particularized, then you have to determine how to manifest the archetype in your conditions. And again, I think this is just beautiful. Abraham Kuyper, there's not one square inch over God's creation in which he does not declare this is mine. And, and what happens then, Christians talk about we become more like Christ. Well, does that mean we become like first century carpenters? No, we actually, within our contexts, become Christ within our context. And this is a this is an incredible thought because Christ is somehow recognizable in all of the multitude of contexts that we see. Well, well, how will he be recognizable? And again, so often we can't articulate it. We we can we can point it out when we see it, or we point out aspects when we see it, and then you swing back to what he was talking about before. It's this constant conversation. People people say, well, the church can't agree. Well, that's right, the church can't agree. Well, why can't the church agree? Because the church is always working on this. And and that's where the text comes in. Because the in a sense the text is is orientation for us. And so we're always we're always working on this, and then we hold it up to the text. And, well, which text? Well, there's many texts. And so we're, we're in fact, always working on which text is that is where on the hierarchy. And if, if you look at the history of the Christian church, this is a very live conversation that goes century after century. And we're all trying to embody Christ, whether you're a 55-year-old man who lives in Sacramento, or you're a 30-year-old woman who lives in Los Angeles, or you're a 15-year-old uh, youth who lives in Buenos Aires, Argentina. It's We're embodying Christ within this context. We say, well, 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 make me a list of what Christ is. And now you can begin to see how this is beyond the law, because whereas if you look at the law, you can gain orientation from looking at the law, but laws are are very contextual. Even abstracted laws like you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You say, well, well, what about what about being a soldier? You kill when you're a soldier. Is that what this law is about? And and so what about what about stealing? Is is not um, is is not paying my workers enough? Is that a form of stealing? And so, in fact, you're always working at this. And so, of course, when you get into the New Testament, you get into love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. So, love then can become the test. Okay, how much should I pay my workers? Well, you should love your workers. Well, what does that mean? That means you should figure out what is right to pay them. If you pay them too much, you know. There's, there can be problems with that. If you pay them too little, there can be definitely problems with that. You have to figure out the right amount. Well, well, why doesn't why isn't there a law that comes out from heaven to tell me the right amount? No, this is a little bit later. He's going to talk about you know this is the co-laboring that we're doing with God. In fact, in all of this, in your specific conditions, that, and that's partly associated with that dialogue with your conscience. So. Now he's going to get into conscience, but but before he goes there, it's it's very interesting because I remember a question that's asked by one of his students in it could have been maps of meaning or the personalities. Why can't we 
why can't someone just tell the purely archetypal tale? And this is exactly the reason that he's stating here, because you cannot have an archetype, you cannot, you cannot hug an archetype without skin on it. You, you cannot see and know an archetype without contextuality. It all involves these contexts. And so then what we do with stories is we multiply the stories. So you have Star Wars, and you have ancient Rome, and you have you know, 19th century England, and you have 20th century India, and you have 21st century China, and you have story after story after story after story with all these different contexts. You have Middle Earth, you have Hogwarts, you have Narnia. You just you just multiply the stories, and from these multitude of stories, we're always working on this question: What is the good? What is the true? What is the beautiful? We're we're always working on these things. We don't even pay attention that we are most of the times, but we're always working, and then we're we're attracted to them. Now, I also had a conversation which didn't record. He didn't want to record it, and every time I don't record, it's like. I should have recorded it because then I'd have a better copy of it. But, but we were talking about we were talking about the fact of see now I forgot I got I distracted myself. Anyway, I'll think about it in a minute. So there's an archetypal mode of being that's that's supposedly ideal, and you have to integrate it with your surroundings. That's and what needs to happen. Every right, that's what it has to be met. That's right. It has to be manifest in the particulars of your time and place. Yeah. And that's the individuation process. Yeah, but that's exactly what it is because Jung regarded the self. Now, the, the thing about Jung is that a lot of his terms, like self, it isn't really that connected with our colloquial understanding of self. Self is a much bigger thing that's out there. Well, he'll talk about it. Like Jung regarded Christ as a symbol of the self. He actually reversed the the, the spiritual and the psychological. Yeah. Right. Or the theological and the psychological, he, and he thought he was thinking about the cosmic Christ as a, and for Jung, the self was the totality of individual being. It was yeah. everything that you were right now, everything that you were in the past, but also everything that you could possibly become across your your set of potential yeah. futures. That's not a heretical idea. That's a really powerful idea, and when, when, so a number of years ago, I was I was actually thinking about writing a book, and and I wanted to I wanted to write a book about basically rewriting a lot of Christianity in relational terms, and and I spent a lot of time thinking about the self, the soul, the psyche, and and thinking about how this plays in the New Testament. And, and what exactly is it of us that is preserved in the Christian tradition? Unlike, let's say, reincarnation, where there's some there's some element of myself, but but all of the accidents of Paul Vanderclay are stripped away. What what happens in, in Christianity is that I am refined and I am raised, and and the resurrected Paul Vanderclay will will bear the potentiality of the Paul Vanderclay you see now. He will be perfected. He will bear this potentiality and you know then in the new heavens and the new earth this goes out and, and this goes forward. There's there's one paragraph from Jung that I'm going to send to you in the chat right now. And I would like to ask you if you could could read it out. It's not that long because I think that illustrates exactly what, what you're talking about. Um, sending you a link. Oh. If you click on it, it's an image. And when, you probably know it. When a summit is reached, when the bud unfolds, and from the lesser the greater emerges, then as Nietzsche says, one becomes two. And the greater figure, which one always was, but which remained invisible, appears to the lesser personality with the force of a revelation. Yes, and that's the manifestation of the self. That's right. What that is is an intimation of who you could be. Yeah. And it's, it's also an intimation of what you're associated with that might guide you to what you could be. So, so it would, you might say it's a revelation of your own possibility, but it's, 
your rev a revelation of your possibility in relationship to something that's infinite and transcendent. Yeah, yeah. that's the that's the, and and I would also say that that does that is also very commonly manifested by a transformation in the relationship with conscience. Because when something like this happens, sometimes this happens to people, for example, in um, hallucinatory or psychedelic experiences, right? They start to take their conscience seriously. As the See, Jung believed at least to some degree that what guided your interest, and that would include your conscience, was a manifestation of the totality of the self in the restricted domain of the present. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, okay, so, so, okay, which one always was, but which remained invisible, right, that's the heavenly father, that would be the, the Marcus Aurelius principle that manifests itself in, in, in Maximus, and that, yeah. that, that, that Carmides resists, mm -hmm. right, and, and which Marcus Aurelius also made himself subordinate to, at least to some degree, right, that's the, the one which always was, but which remained invisible. Yeah. He was truly and hopelessly little, will always drag the revelation of the greater down to the level of his littleness. And will never understand that the day of judgment for his littleness has dawned. But the man who is inwardly great will know that the long expected friend of his soul, the immortal one, has now really come to lead captivity captive. That is, to that sounds a lot like Luke 4. Seize hold of him by whom this immortal had always been confined and held prisoner, and to make his life flow into that greater life, a moment of deadliest peril. Nietzsche's prophetic vision of the tightrope walker reveals the awful danger that lies in having a tightrope walking attitude towards an event to which St. Paul gave the most exalted name he could find. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, quite, the, that's quite the densely packed paragraph, yeah. that one. Uh, for, that for, is, for a few years ago, it's from, it's from uh, the Archetypes and the Collective Unconscious, right. page 121. If, uh, right. and that's volume one, right? Because volume two is Ion, which is even a more frightening book. So yes, because the, the peril that Jung talks about there is the peril of psychosis, at least in part, inflation. Because well, the, the manifestation of that, that second figure, let's say, the self, it's, it's, it's a deadly temptation as well, because once you see that there's a relationship between you and the transcendent let's say and you start to take that seriously then you can you can you can become inflated by that yeah sense of prophetic duty let's say and 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 that's and that's a very dangerous temptation. yeah that he actually writes this like 20 pages further he says for the great psychic danger which always is is always connected with individuation lies in the identification of ego consciousness with the self. This produces yes. inflation which, threaten, which threatens conscience, consciousness yes. with dissolution. Yes, and he wrote a great essay, a great essay called Relations Between the Ego and the Unconscious, which is completely uncom incomprehensible unless you know the background that we're discussing, where he warned very carefully that you have to stay in the proper relationship <clears throat> to the self, right? If the self overtakes the 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 ego, then mm -hmm. that's a descent into like manic religious insanity. Yeah. Something that balance has to be struck where there's a relationship with the transcendent, but there's also still the grounding in the particulars of here and now. You see this echo, this idea echoed, interestingly enough, in the superhero mythology that, that dominated the adolescent imagination in the 20th century. Every superhero, so imagine a superhero is like a partial manifestation of the redemptive archetype. Mm -hmm. Every superhero has to have an alter ego. And the alter ego, well, for Superman, it's Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter. And for Spider-Man, it's, you know, high school, troubled high school quasi-nerd. And but, but what's so interesting about those stories is that they understand that without the alter ego, there's no superhero. And and that's it's really brilliant. That both of those have to exist at the same time. The limitations mm -hmm. 
and the and the transcendence of the limitations have to both be there. Yeah. And and you get this in terms of Christ, Christ in terms of Orthodox uh, Christian doctrine. Christ is fully human, fully divine. When when you watch him in the Gospels, he is stilling storms and raising the dead, and he gets hungry, and he gets tired, and he gets frustrated with his disciples who can't seem to catch a clue, and he, and and but but you don't have Jesus going into a phone booth and coming out with a cape. You have this all integrated into him, and and this is again and. One of the con the conversation that didn't tape yesterday. We we're talking about healing and miracles, but Jesus, you know, so the temptations of Jesus. Well, their stones make them bread. Well, C.S. Lewis makes the point that he won't turn stones to bread because that is unfitting for the Creator God. There's multiple layers. There. It's also Jesus doesn't use his own power to rescue himself. This is what you see in the superhero movies. They're always selfless. They've been given amazing power, and they are to use it for the good of others. And this is this is this is in this is built into Christ Jesus in terms of who he is in the Gospels. He he can still storms. He can raise the dead. He can he can do all of this, but he himself allows himself to be beaten and bloodied and mocked and he suffers willingly let's see if i can make it through this i might be able to that terrible paradoxical juxtaposition yeah and yeah. so because the, the the character isn't the character can't exist without that tension and, yeah. and, I, and i think that that's well that motif wouldn't recur continually unless there was something to it that was narratively precise and yeah. accurate there's something in the in this paragraph that i want to tie together with our uh, previous talk because jung talks about the end stage of individuation as as a coming together with the immortal he calls it the immortal yeah. now joseph campbell campbell does exactly the same he says the christ in you doesn't die the christ in you survives death and resurrects and you said in our last talk when you um closed your um you, elabor you elaborated on the death of Socrates and how he died in truth and honor. And then you said that part of the spirit doesn't die. So there is this theme of these people are somehow connected with something that is immortal and, and eternal. Could that be understood simply as they have, they have established a relation with an archetypal mode of being that is eternal? And that continues to exist uh, beyond them and before them, but they've they've established a relationship with that. Is is that what the, what he means by by the immortal? Well, that, yes, that that is that's what's meant. Is that that's mm -hmm. right? It's that it's the eternal pattern. It's the eternal yeah, music. Exactly. It's, it's like you're yeah. dancing to the eternal music, and the music goes on even if you depart the scene. Yeah, exactly. Now, now the Christian, there's a Christian insistence though. That, that I also wouldn't overlook, which is that that also characterizes the finite, right? That's the promise of the resurrection, that the resurrection of the body, is that the Christians insist that that transcendent factor exists, and, and that's the Christ, that's the word that's there at the beginning of time and at the end of time as, as the judge in Revelation, right? This transcendent logos that's, yeah. that's eternal, but that that's no more valuable in some sense than the particular the yeah. particularized creature that's 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 subject to apparent apparent permanent death jesus after his resurrection continues to bear his scars in his hand why it's 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 history you know you don't Jesus isn't lost in the resurrection. He isn't displaced by the resurrection. He he is perfected in the resurrection. How can he be perfected if he's already, already perfect? Again, we difficulty language in these things. But but Peterson is dead on right, and this is right. Christians insist on this resurrection, on a bodily resurrection, on a physical resurrection. Why? Lots of reasons. Oops. And, yeah. you know, it's very difficult for modern people to 
grant the idea of the bodily resurrection any credence. And I, it's not something of which anyone can speak, I believe, with any degree of, what would you say it, non-arrogant authority, something like that. But by the same token, the world is a very strange place. And it isn't obvious to me that I've learned to, I've learned to be very cautious in casually dismissing deep and ancient ideas, regardless of their strangeness. Now, when I, when I get back to the Maxwell video, we'll talk about that because something happened in the history of Western philosophy that makes us pause here at the resurrection. Whereas Peter, Paul, read the book of Acts, Paul, Peter and Paul go out and they preach the resurrection. They, and they preach the, and these were people who, I mean, Paul, after his conversion, goes to Jerusalem, finds Peter, finds James, the brother of Jesus, meets with the apostle because he wants to, he wants to talk to people that will say, yeah, I touched him. I saw his scars. This is what he's doing. You can look at Gary Habermas's video on, on, from UCSD that he did on Veritas Forum, where he walks through the argument, says, we can know Paul. And, and, and we, can, we can get right down here to the resurrection. Now, why do Christians insist on this? Well, I think the better question is why in the history of the West did we decide we can't believe this because the rest of the world doesn't have a problem with it. This is, this is our problem. Mm -hmm. And I do think that, see, the thing that's so interesting about that Christian insistence is that it valorizes the particular. It's unbelievably important because you could say, well, if it's merely a matter of the eternal, then the particular doesn't matter. But then if the particular doesn't matter, you end up with that kind of nihilistic Buddhism, the suffering that characterizes, or even in, in the proclivity. You should say Gnosticism here, because that, that also goes there. For Christianity to degenerate into the forms that Nietzsche criticized, which is, well, when you... And Kierkegaard. You chase everything out into an eternal beyond. It justifies everything terrible that's happening on Earth as trivial and insignificant and relieves you of your moral responsibility for, for addressing it. And, and it valorizes... So, so you get the Imago Dei that valorizes, means, I mean, gives value to. That gives value to every human being. But this comes through very, very clearly in C.S. Lewis's work, too, that the resurrection means that, okay, so let's say, let's say I talk to someone else. How do I treat them? Well, I should treat them, see, in, in, in terms of our limited history, we treat people as disposable. I'm going to use their services now. I'm going to use them now, and I'll never know them. Well, in the resurrection, you might be spending eternity with this person. And, and the history that you are building now does not evaporate at the resurrection. We don't know how this is translated. We don't know how this is brought to fruition. We don't know how this is, but, but as Peterson says, this valorizes all of history. And, and Dostoevsky knows that. This valorizes all of history. And so how I treat Another image bearer of God is not just about image bearing, it's also about the resurrection. That I, I can't just simply be rude and, and dispose of people because not only are they image bearers of God, but they are, they are eternal, as C.S. Lewis being, says, they are eternal beings that either one day will be the type of being that right now we would be tempted to worship, or will be one type of being that right now we would run in terror from. So, how do we treat human beings? We treat them with a great deal of respect. Because this is the story. You can't, at the very minimum, the idea that the body is resurrected is a valorization of the value of the particular here and now and of the body. And, and an emphasis on the fact that that has divine value as well and needs to be attended to and cared for properly. At minimum, it's that. Yeah. It's profound. 
There's one uh, one thing uh, under you. And, and again, I, I, I'm a little curious about this guy. I mean, he's obviously been tracking Peterson. The first interview, he had all these lists. He's been he's studying Peterson. But, but at some point, you have to ask, if you're a big enough Star Wars fan, will you will you don the clothes and go to the theater for the sacrament? Will you at some point begin to embody, not just theorize and not just not just postulate theoretically what all of this stuff means, but will you start to walk into the drama and decide to live it? Well, what does it mean to live in that drama? Well, it means to relate to the story. It means to live in the story. It means to inhabit the story. One paragraph I want to reflect on. It's uh, when he says that individuation is a could be a moment of deadliest peril, and then he refers to the to the tightrope walker from Zarathustra. Uh, what I think this means is that it can be so the, the danger can be so grave when you embark on individuation because it it almost by definition means that a that the lesser you, the lesser part of your soul, the lesser soul, has to die. Yeah. And, and Christian history we call that mortification uh, mortician mort death part of being a christian is dying to self and then and i think i've been there in, in my own life and that, that re requires violence and recovery is by no means guaranteed right that's exactly well that's why that's why that motif that's the motif uh, figurative violence okay we're not going to wear a hair shirt and beat ourselves teeth of going into the abyss to re to to rescue your father like it's an abyss there's no guarantee yeah. that you'll emerge from it no like it it, 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 it it's a real it's genuine peril now the you know the 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 what you need to be armed with in some sense to face that is the willingness to die, the faith yeah. in rebirth, the 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 what the the willingness as well, or or the the decision to start to abide by the truth. This is the Christian life. Yeah, because in a moment of great peril, this is another thing that that, that this is one of the things I think that terrified me into um, attempting to abide by the truth to the degree that I've been able to manage that. See, I, I started to understand, not least by reading Jung, that there would come points in my life where I needed to rely on my own judgment, that I would be in a particular situation that no one could advise me about, because no one would have access to the information about the particularities of my situation that I would have, and that I could call on my relationship with the eternal, let's say, to some degree, but... Prayer? but also the body of Christ. This is in fact, because in, in Christian theology, you are, say, well, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. Oh, okay. I, do you, are you going to be connected? See, so Christ in Pauline theology is, is Jesus, it's Jesus' title, but Paul keeps talking about us being in Christ. And so that aspect then, it's the Holy Spirit, it's prayer, it's, it's participating in the traditions of the church, in the community of the church, in, in growing in the spirit. This is natural theology he's doing here. It's Christian natural theology. It's just, he's just using different terms. If I had warped and corrupted my own judgment, then when, when the necessity for a decision emerged, I would make the wrong decision. Yeah. And then I'd be lost. What, what stood out to me, the few times you talked about this, you, so, uh, in a few lectures, like as a sidetrack, you talked about the death of the soul. And what, what stood out to me is that you did this in a very, very visceral way. You really felt, it seemed to me like you felt the gravity of it. it um, and then when you uh, kind of la laid out your own story that you had to stop drinking, had to stop smoking to... to um, to focus more on your work, uh, intuitively there was to, there was a kind of a disparity between how visceral you could talk about the death of the soul. We all have our own hard things in our lives that we have to that we have to die to self with. 
Um, and not everybody, some people don't have any problem drinking, some people don't have any problem smoking, but they got, everybody's got their problem somewhere, and it's, a, and, it's a, and it's a biggie for them. And what you described as what that meant for you, which I interpreted as mainly changing your lifestyle a little and, uh, and, and focus on your studies. So the question would be that, why, why, why do you think I, I saw that disparity? And, and if the disparity is indeed there, how is it that you can talk about the death of the soul with such vigor? Well, I think, I, I do think that there are things that are worse than death. I mean, I think that psychological disintegration might be worse than death because it can go on for so long and, and it can be so incredibly painful. Yeah. I do think that your point about communists, communists is correct, is that the state that he exists in is worse than death. It's hell. Yeah. And now the disparity, I'm not sure exactly what you meant by that. Like, um, yeah. Um, what, what I meant was is that you talk with such vigor and in such a visceral way about the death of the soul. And then when you talked about letting parts of yourself die, you said it was mainly it was stop drinking, stopping and stop smoking. Well, it, was so you could just... it was your responsibility, I would say, at least to some degree. It, it, was, mm -hmm. it was the letting go of that because I had to make a choice between something approximating gratifying immediate pleasure seeking and hyper social, a hyper social way of being, you know, that wasn't sustainable in, in many ways for obvious reasons. And doing <coughs> doing the difficult intellectual work yeah. that I had decided to embark on. And that was a that's a death of a previous personality. And mm -hmm. it is trivial in some sense because it's 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 burning off that which obviously needs to be burned off. But I would also say by the same token that that doesn't make it a straightforward process. It's, and you alluded to this, you know, you said that you underwent a similar set of experiences where the old parts of you had to die. It's like, well, that's suboptimal and immature as they are. First of all, those are still parts that are alive and still and still an element of your being. They might even be parts that you love and that other people love. Yeah. And, and there's certainly things that you're familiar with, or there are modes of being that you're familiar with. It's, it's a major sacrifice to let yeah. elements of your personality go. It's, it's also By the way, a proper sacrifice. It was not an indictment on your part. No, it was I, just I one of no, no, I understand that. Good, good. See, the problem with the identity politics types, as far as I'm concerned, is that they're proclivity is always to sacrifice someone else the oppressor that's right and and what jesus does is jesus comes into the garden and the temple guard comes for him and peter pulls out a sword and he's going to live our welfare at the expense of our enemies and jesus comes into that garden and says if anyone's blood is going to be shed here let it be mine. There's the Christian life. Jesus takes the weight of the world on himself for us. Well, what does that mean for us? Well, can we do it? Well, we're not him. So we don't have the capacity he does. So he first did it for us. And what then do we do? We respond in gratitude. We respond in adoration. He is the leader. He is the one going ahead forward. He is the one who he he is the one who does it for us. And so we want to be like him. And and this is where this is where law ends and freedom begins. Be, this this is where we stop saying, I need to do this in order to push my rock up a hill. This is where we say I want to do this because I want to go up that hill with him, because I want to be like him, because I want to embody him in the particularity, the unique particularity of the time and place and story that I am in this world. And this is the way that Christ invades this world. I asked in a previous video, who is more successful, Genghis Khan or Jesus? 
Genghis Khan spreads his seeds, his genetic material, at least that we know it, one of the most successful people that we can name on record. You know, 300 million people are direct descendants of Genghis Khan. Jesus invades us. We become him. And, and we don't become him mindlessly. We don't become him under duress. We become him freely, joyfully. We long to become him. And at that moment that we become him, we become truly ourselves. And, and so we are most like him as we are most unique in and of ourselves. And that is our true self. It's not a secret, sacred self. It is the self that, that we become through him in communion with him. C.S. Lewis talks about the fact that in, in good relationships, so C.S. Lewis had a friend, Charles Williams, who died. And, and one of the things that C.S. Lewis mourned was that the part of C.S. Lewis that connected with Charles Williams died with Charles. And that part of C.S. Lewis that, that C.S. Lewis could only know when he was with his friend and by virtue of who his friend was, went into the tomb with Charles. Christ binds us. We are baptized into his death. And then we are baptized into his resurrection, Romans 6. With, with Christ, that doesn't end. In fact, it's, as in the last battle, it's further up and further in. Now, I'm going to pause it here because there are a number of things that I wanted to talk about in this video. I don't know if they're coming at the end. There's Raphael. There's Jacob and wrestling with God. I, I've listened to this three times so far, and I'm very excited about this video. So I will do a part two to this, but I'm out of time. I got to do a conversation with my friend John Van Donk, who's following up on a video that I did before. And then we've got a couple of conversations with, with some other folks that are on my list of people who've wanted, who want to talk to me. So thanks for watching. By all means, watch this video. I don't mean this, uh, yeah, watch this video. You're already watching it. But watch the, he calls it responsibility, conscience, and meaning. So much good stuff in this video from, from start to finish. Very excited about it. Thank you, Jordan, for, for doing this for us. I really appreciate it.